Tom Simmons, I've known for many years. We both go to this well, quaint little place called Sea View in the Isle of Wight uh, and sell these funny little Sea View dinghies. Uh, one design by us that uh, would serve for about a couple of months a year down there. But Colin's done a lot of international sailing uh, in different fleets and um, sadly got selected to go to the Olympics, we couldn't go because, uh, in the sailing class because the uh, British government, or, or so, I think the RIA, decided to uh, boycott that. So uh, it's one opportunity to was taken away from them, but never mind. We <laughs> end up in many other areas. <laughs> but what, when I put this together, Colin uh, did this for us in Dubai. Uh, I, I rather sort of dropped a minute at this time, so. He's not at breakfast this morning. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I just, the, what I did, when, when I circulated the, um, the plan, I just put down some pretty warm, uh, sort of eight memoir topics of what people might want to discuss. And um, I've got some spare things here for anyone who wants to pick it up. I've also got, there was another thing I found on the website, which I had many years ago, which I've got ten copies with, it's quite detailed with all the, some people's like, this is fairly early on, I think, in the class. <coughs> how to sail, sail the boat, um, and I guess what we, we, what we were going to do is just uh, have a discussion here in the cool, and then go down, when we go to rig the boats up, Colin is going to take us through one of the boats, discuss setup and so on, and then we thought we'd go up on the water and do a series of wind do it, races and some uh, you know, up and down, and then uh, we can have a critique on the water what we're doing. And perhaps uh, maybe, I mean, Colin, from your experience, maybe you know what the common errors are that we sailors go through. You know, some of us are better than others here. Yeah. Uh, it's really mainly, I think, a lot of boat handling issues is what uh, we all need. As opposed to detailed discussion on rules and tactics, etc. <laughs> all right. So, uh, there we go. So I don't know what, how, how we want to do it. That was a mess and quite sad. Um, in fact, I gave me depression for 20 years. <laughs> it's a strange thing that you work yourself up for 12 years to be in a team and then it gets cancelled. So why was it the troops in Afghanistan? Oh, it was, which troops was it? No, then it was the Russians. Now, of course, it's our lot in there. Uh, thank God the Russians are more sensible to point out our But enough of that, I then went on to sell J24s, uh, which was tremendous. Um, uh, never quite won the Nationals, I had a couple of seconds and a third. Um, I went to the J24 World, the Europeans, and usually finished in the top five. Again, then I should win anything. Um, but by then I was retired and had a family and was doing it part time. I bought my SP3 in 2003, I think. Uh, 2005, I bought the first SP3. Um, and I hadn't done any competitive racing for 10 years, family and all that, and I thought they were tremendous fun. Best uh, the best fun we'd had for a long time. I remember my brother, the first time I took my younger brother out, he was blowing about 25. We were coming to the word mark, and he said, That's not worth taking down. I'm having too much fun. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, we did take it down. But um, no, I think they're tremendous, especially in a blow. Uh, very, very responsive and tremendous fun boat. So I, I actually just sold mine, uh, which is a shame. But um, our combined ages is well past 180 now, the three of us. <laughs> And um, I remember the uh, Europeans in France, and we won three races in a day, and they gave us a special prize. We all went up the walking stick. Because <laughs> <laughs> we were about 20 years older than most of the people there. Um, we're selling the boat now and going to go travel a bit. Uh, but we had a lot of fun we on the Nationals. That's back to the end of 2007, I think, the Nationals. Um, which wasn't bad for three boats of about 60 each. Um, so the main thing about sailing about today is have some fun, and I know there's a tremendously different range of standards here. So what I'm going to do is just go through a few subjects to get the thing started, and then we'll get some questions going, because from that, it's, it's much more important when you talk to me than I talk to you, because I can dribble on for hours. Um, and the main thing is we try to have some fun today on the water and in here, and uh, that's the way we'll go. So uh, I thought I'd start at the beginning, uh, which is looking after your boat. One of the problems 
with sunshine as it wraps the sails. And I notice you've all still got yellow bags, well, for the ones I've seen. Those yellow bags do not keep the sun out. If you leave your mainsail laid out on the grass, just as an example, for a whole day, in strong sunshine, it will shrink by one centimetre. You just lost one centimetre of your sail size. A two-year-old sail in a hot country like this will probably be four inches smaller on the luff and the leech than a new sail. You just gave away four inches of your power. You just cut your engine size. So my first suggestion to you guys is go and buy a set of dark blue bags to keep the sun off your sails on the dock. And never leave your sails in the sun because you, that is just killing your motor. That is your motor. Don't let it, don't let it sit in the sun. Um, and um, so yeah, that's a small suggestion to start with. Looking after the boats. Um, keel and hull, well, obviously that's got to be clean. And um, you're, there's a limit to what you're allowed to do to these boats. Um, I don't know whether any of you have vibration at speed, but you are allowed to trim the trailing gauge to get a bit of uh, vibration at speed. You know, the boat starts to make that humming noise. There are a few things you're allowed to do. And you know, if you need to sand off and polish your keel, you have to because you get scratched and that's permitted. So you've got to keep the hull in shape and that sort of thing. Now, um, the, um, moving on to, to the rig. Um, the rig. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> um, well my drawing is not as good as my set. Just a little bit. So down there, and down there. Got one there, and one there. So, false day, back stay, mast. Um, I haven't read this stuff. But what I do um, is the important thing to me is, is to take the main handed and there's that little gooseneck thing that sort of sticks out, you know, little, little ball things with the to go through. And I pull that tight into the little hole. And I get the main and pull it really tight. I'm looking up the uh, track to see that the mast is straight. Because if the mast is straight, you, you, you haven't got a starting point. So when I'm looking from behind, looking up the sail, I want to make sure, first of all, the mast is in column. And we can, we'll, we'll do it on the water. We'll, we'll mess with the mast and show you how to make sure that's right. The next thing I want to know is what that distance is, approximately. You look up and go, how far is my main halyard from the mast at its maximum point? So what is my maximum next? And we'll talk about that when we're down there. But, um, it's like three inches, four inches. So now a new sail needs more bend than an old sail. They get flatter with age. So there's no magic position. Um, an old sail will need a, a straight mast, probably. The next thing I do is I sit at the back of the boat and I look up at that and I put the back stay on. And as you look at the top of the mast, like any I'll just do it again. Don't, don't, don't worry. <laughs> Uh, get that here. That's where it is. Alright. I'm just going to cheat. Alright, the top's where it is. The top's where it is there. So, okay, that's that. It's the mid that's what it is. Okay. Just look at that drawing for a second. Um, <coughs> so I'm sitting down here at the back of the boat. I'll put the back stair on. There's one of 20 seconds. I'll look for the back of the boat. And I'll start putting the back stair on. Slowly putting it on until one of these goes loose. So you're looking at the mid atlas, as I call them, which is the little ones before the top of the rig. What I want to know is which one goes loose first. Because if either of them go loose before the other, that's wrong. They ought to both go loose at the same moment. You can just see the sudden tension goes off and they start to sag. Alright? That will tell you, A, are they set up the same? And when I do this on these sort of events, half of them are not set up the same because people haven't 
had time to think about it. Um, and it's poor climbing mean, up there and change them. And it also gives you some idea of when they come off. Because if they come off very quickly, they're not tight enough. If you put on just a small amount of backstay, they're ready to go loose. This is not holding the top of your mask right. These, these metals have a lot of shape at the top. And so you want these mid apples to have bent the top of your mask a bit. Otherwise, the top of your mask is so immensely so deep in light air that, the, as I described, the lazy wind can't get around it. You know, it just won't flatten out enough. So these mid, this mid upper strength tension, and again, it varies on the main source and the age of the main source, but you need to have some idea what is your mid upper tension. And the more, and, and I like to feel that they don't come off until I put on quite a lot of backstay. Be more precise than that, just like, yeah, that looks about right. And you get a feel, yeah, I'm going, I'm going lower when I have it like that. And uh, so the mid uppers are surprisingly important. And if they're too loose, you will be slapped. It doesn't matter who's helping, you'll be slapped if they're too loose. Uh, soon you've got the rest of the stuff roughly in the right place. So the mid uppers are quite important. Um, they're that last extra length and a half on the beach. That means you cross the other guys and get around the mark first, or you have to go to the back of the queue. Because let's face it, in one design race, you all arrive at the mark pretty much together, and the guy that's got an extra length for two of the meet is the guy that gets around first, gets the guy out first, and then he's gone. Because everything in one design is trying to find an extra length up beat. And on a one mile beat, you get that wrong, you're going to lose two or three lengths. You've got to get it rough and right. So there we are. Now let's talk about the reef. So I've got my three inches there, which is sitting on the dock, and, and I've checked that the top part of the mast doesn't look too straight, because it, should be, it shouldn't be just the bend in the middle, you've got to see there's some bend in the top as well, you kind of eyeball that. So you've got some bend in the top, and uh, don't show anybody in England, they'll tell me I'm wrong. Because, <laughs> you know, everyone has their own view on this, there's no magic one, I'm just telling you what I do, you know. And, um, um, and I have to, you know, and it comes from, same sort of thing I did in J24 and sewing slightly different rigs, but you, you, you learn your own systems. Now, um, we've got the bend there, the bend there, the bend there, that's right. Now, the tension, right. Okay, so you've got, you've got the shards coming down here, and you've got shards coming down there, and shards coming down there. So you've got three lots of shards coming, they're all pulling the mast backwards. Alright? And if you want more bend, Key is your tension differences. Call that TD. Now, if your tension on the uppers is 30 and on the mediums is 20, I'll call that 10 TD. Alright? You've got a 10 difference between your uppers and your, mid and, and your middle ones. I'll come back to the lowers in the middle and admit it. They're relatively unimportant. I'll come back to the bottom ones in a minute. They're really there to stop the mask falling over when you put the kicker on. A bit more than that. If you've got a 10 difference, you're going to have a lot of bend in the mask. Particularly the top one's tight. If you went to 2010, the ring is so loose, it won't really bend the mask. It's not, that's not enough pressure to get any difference on the mask. Now, I, de I generally settle with a 6 TD in light. A minus one in heavy. In heavy areas, I'll make my lowers, not between heavy and 25 knots, we don't get that here very much. 25 plus, you're actually going to have the lowers tighter. Now, the reason for that is in light hairs, the make is quite full, and you're desperately trying to get some bend because it, it, the, the wind can't get around it. And in heavy areas, you're desperately trying to make the force stay tighter. Once you cross the 10 knot barrier and you start to put the backstay on, which tightens the force there and gives you some pointing, the rig's going to fall apart if it's loose. When the mast bends, the mainsail goes completely flat or worse, and you're in trouble. So you're allowed to adjust the, the shrouds in the race. I often do. The wind gets up ahead on the first beat. Um, we'll, we'll get the, the equipment down and actually tighten it during the race, because otherwise you can't hold the boat to the wind. Now, a 6TD is 
right, six knots of bricks or less. Because you're desperately trying to make this one loose so that any pressure on the rig will start to bend the mast. Um, and as the wind gets stronger, you tighten the middle one. Because otherwise, when you put the back stay on, this heads off this direction very quickly. And as it heads off this direction, the distance between here and here reduces, because obviously, if you bend the mast, the dip, it reduces, and that makes everything even looser. Because the moment you reduce the distance between there and there, you can just imagine that distance, and you bent it, it's getting sh shorter. That means the rig goes even looser and holds it up even less well. And of course, this rig is pretty cheap to stretch it. So as the wind comes up, tighten it up. Do it the way you have to, because otherwise the, the rig is just going to go pissed. It's had enough. So, TD is what I call it, everyone has a good way, um, but it's, it's just a nice, easy expression to remember. And, uh, Welcome, welcome. Hi. Right. And I think what I'm going to do now is I've done enough talking and I've got questions about setting, getting the boat in the water, sail hand, sail, sail looking after, and rigs first. And I've talked long enough on that subject. But did you get the basic idea that the middle, I didn't talk about the bottom line, sorry, but the middle one is what stops the mast bending forward. And if it bends forward too much, the mast will disintegrate. But in light airs, you want it to bend forward, and in heavy airs, you want to stop it bending forward, which is why the TD changes. The bottom one, in light airs, you're trying to get the mast to bend. Don't put any bottom one, because you're stopping it bending. The bottom one, I literally, is, I, I can move mine with, my, with two fingers like that. It's, it, you won't even get anything on the tension being on mine, and because you want the mast to bend. And in heavy air is what you're doing, you're holding the middle and you want the top and bottom of the bed. So I still don't use it very much. So my bottom one never goes tighter than on the, on the, on the gauge, about sort of 5 or 10 maximum. Very loose on the bottom because you want it to bend, especially in light air. Okay, I'll, I'll start now. Any questions? If there's no questions, I'm going for a beer. Strong <laughs> beer. <laughs> <laughs> you go, rig tighter crew. <laughs> Uh, no, we, we carry, um, I carry a seven spanner, which is the exact spanner for the rigging, and uh, a, a screwdriver. You stick a screwdriver in the rigging, and you make sure it's well greased, because you can't do it without grease, and you tighten it. And um, particularly when you have three races in a day, what you're really doing is between the races. And as soon as the race is finished, the kite's down, and I'm going, am I happy with the rig now? Has the wind changed? Yes, it has changed. It's got up, crew, spanner's out. Two, two on the outers, one on the inners, or whatever you're doing, to get back into my grid. But you, you're not, are you pulling the loose gauge out after you, after you adjust this, or you just go and do No, no, you know. You know, um, roughly speaking, that one on the, the two on the outers is the same as one on the inners, because they're half the length. Okay? So if you want to go upgrade, you tell the crew two on the outers. <coughs> it won't be perfect, but you're getting nearer the grid. And if you've got up the beat and put the back still on, the mates has gone there, you've got to put the inners on. That's easy. Put, tell them to put one and a half, two on the inners. It's partly mental too. You want to, when the race starts, you don't want to go, oh God, somebody rolled me, I want to put my inners tighter. You want to, before the race starts, not the inners tighter, he's rolling me, what am I doing wrong? You, know, you don't want to blame the boat. You want to know that it's you who's doing it wrong. If you've got the boat set up right, then you can really focus on the tune. I'm not worried about it. Any more questions on the rig? Because if you end like, like that situation where you're out sailing and you're wearing light, light, light money, uh, and you say, you're trying to assess why the boat's not going, there's many things that can be under the mask. So if you, if you, because it depends on the, the sea condition too, when it's combination. How would you assess, you say, blur? If that doesn't feel good, is it? Is it you, well, you, 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 you go through like you more, 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 more,
Yeah. Let's work through that area. Okay, okay. the first of all, you going to 10 dots. Yeah, all right. You develop over a number of hours on the water your own half dozen things that you try. Okay. Now, one of the, uh, one of the critical things is the distance of the hole of the tube from that. Right. And I have a little, uh, little tape on the full stone, mm -hmm. very, very tight tape, so that I've got a lot thing I can see. So I can see how high it is. And I, I'll set the jib so that it comes down and just is an inch above the deck. It's my basic point. All right? Now, if it's an inch above the deck and it's a bit of a chop, then that probably means the jib's too flat. I haven't got enough power. So we'll pull that up a bit. If you pull that up a bit, you're reducing the distance here so the jib gets fuller. If you pull that down a bit, it's increasing the distance, the jib goes flatter. This is your jib fullness and flatness control. And the more you pull it up the rig, the deeper it makes the jib, which means you can't point when you've got more power. So here's, here's your speed gun for more speed, but you won't be able to point. But the worst thing is to be slow and low, isn't it? So mm -hmm. what we all want to do is make sure that even if we can't hold the guy above us, that he can't roll us for speed. So you're immediately going for speed. And uh, so you can relatively it, you can't pull it up, of course, except through attack, and even that could be a model unless you cruise down good. If you finish up coming up attack with a jib down, that isn't too fast. But that is quite a good control to do. You do it on the run because you're at the next beat, you have a bit more power. Or I was going like shit, but I wasn't pointing, so we'll pull it down a bit. So that's one control. And you develop, you know, I know that a bit more backstay might help me. Let's just try a little backstay. I mean, in, ten, in this kind of breeze, I'll have enough backstay on to stop the mast rocking but no more than that. And the moment I'm finding that the boat's healing too much, um, and I'm tending to pinch a bit, they'll put a little backstay on. They like a bit of backstay relatively early to get, some, to get the boat really moving. Um, and, uh, well, sure. that, what that's doing, is that like intentionally bending the mast, or is it... Sort it's of intentionally bending the, the mast. It's, it's flattening the full stay. It goes very often you're in flat water, you want to point high. You put the back stay on, it flattens the, it flattens the jib, flattens the mainsail, and those boats run. Once you've got up to about hull speed, I mean, I watch my speedo, my hawk, I watch the speedo all the time. I know you have speedo at work. But I'm watching that speedo. <laughs> <laughs> speed <laughs> and, uh, I'm watching that speedo, and they're all set I know that on my boat, I need to have 5.4, five, 5.5 five, five on my speedo all the time, once it's 10 knots. And if I'm below that, um, am I overpowered or what am I doing? I've got, and very often, and before the start, I'll go out, I go on port, it's 5.3, okay? 5.3 on start, that's fine. Now I'll try a bit more backstay. Can I get 5.4? Yeah, I'm getting 5.4. Okay, now I'm going slow, I know less backstay. So before the start, I'll do a couple of tacks and just watch the speed and see how she's going. And does she feel right? Can I let go of the, can I let go of the tiller and she round up? Because she's rounding up, that means you've got a lot more back down. Because it, the, the leech is pulling you up. Because you cannot sit up when pulling the, the rudder all the time, it's a break. You've got to have the rudder in balance. You want just a tiny, tiny bit of love. A little bit of lift to keep you, keep you pointing. If, it, if, it, if you let go of the rudder and she tacks, the boat's not sailing right. Because that means all the way up the pulling the rudder. And that's slow. And I'll cost you point one, point two. So you learn a bit of backstay, let's try to jib up a little bit, the jib down a bit, these kind of changes while you're on the water. If you didn't go well at the first beat, for heaven's sake, don't go up the same second beat with the same settings. The chances are that they weren't right for you. And particularly if you're you know, if you're usually able to get to the top mark in the first three and you came seventh and you went the same side as everybody, that setup is not you, you haven't forgotten how to do it. Okay, so chill out, you know, you've had a gym traveler, um, some, of the, some guys use the inner, will still use the inner even in 10 knots, I don't like that. Um, I, 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 I like to go out, because my instinct is to go fast, rather than point. Go fast and then squeeze around when you get the chance. So I expect that when I try to get speed, other people seem to be able to go high all the time, I can't do that. But you, you find your own way to get the boat moving. Moving the jib up out will give you more speed. What about the bang? When do you start to pull that bang? Um, you don't, you, you, you. Oh. <laughs> uh, well, I'm using 
this one? Can I get a coffee? <laughs> um, the um, bag. Okay. Uh, again, we'll do a grid. Actually, well, I'll, I'll put it up here. Um, I'll do this side. I'll put a bag up here. Um, F means finger tight. All you want, don't want to happen is the boom to be bouncing up and down on the waves. So you do not want the bang on because the bang will, will kill the upper reach and really pull it in tight and then you, you've got no speed at all. So all your, you use your main sheet, up on the main sheet travel all the way to the top of the traveler in light air and I let the main sheet loose as I can because I want, I want to let the wind blow the top of the, the, those huge bending buttons out because the leech on these boats is too hard for light airs. You're trying to open the sail and let the wind out. So you don't want any bang. Um, you know, it's one design sail, it's designed for 15 knots, so you're battling with it when it's low or high. Um, and uh, you'd never make a sail like that for light airs if you had a choice. It's a horrible shape for light airs. Now, so you, you, um, you're on bang, that's what I was. It's still about half six in the morning for me, so I'm not quite impressed I'm still going. Um, the, um, so finger tight, just to stop it bouncing, um, and I'll call that two fingers and just sort of give it a bit of a pull in ten knots. When you get to twenty, you start to pull it. And, and uh, you've got, you know, mostly I think you've got those number boards on your, on your bag. Sort of runs one to seven. Um, from wherever is finger tight, you're going to go two or three more when it's blowing um, in order to keep the mace in because now Jerry Hill was one of the worlds in Ghana very rarely uses his bag at all he uses the main trimming system in other words he's got the middle man on the boat is working the main saw and is doing the main job by hand and our age we use a lot of pattern uh, and actually I hold the main sheet upwind because I like to have a light main sheet so I can actually be all the time working it. A little bit out, a little bit in, according to my feel of the rudder, I'm going in and out. Now it's two completely different ways. Um, and uh, um, I don't know whether Jerry's quick with me now that he's 14 years younger or whether, you know, how he does it, but that's how I do it, that's how he does it. Totally different ways. But I like to, I can blow, I, I like to use the traveller and the main sheet and let the man do the work. But in order to do that, I have a tighter um, bottom trouser than he does. Because of course the fan is making the mast bend. So I have to have it slightly tighter than he does in order to stop it just disintegrating the mast with all that pressure from the fan. So, yeah, fan. Next question. Cunningham. 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 Oh yes, I'm sorry, yes. Um, just to the wrinkle side, that's all. I never use it any more than that. I uh, don't like horizontal wrinkles. Um, so over five knots, you just start to just, you know, when the backstay goes on, the whole sail, you just pull it down a bit. It's pretty unimportant, it just makes it look nice. I'm, I'm not a big Cunningham fan. And you must let knock down wind, because when you go down wind, it makes a horrible shape, so you must let it knock down wind. And then the outfall. Outfall, yeah, I'm covered outfall. Um, the um, uh, yeah, uh, outfall offers more power, is more speed, up to about 12, 13 knots, and then outfall off just drags you. Because looking from the top, if that's your boom, and that's your sail on the boom, um, this is the last end. All right. Now, if you uh, if you let the outsole off, the problem is the back of the sail starts to hook. When it's windy, that's awful. So, uh, in, in light, we have the expression that the wind is very lazy when it's light. So, in light airs, you want a very flat sail, because otherwise, maybe five knots or less, the wind can't be bothered to make the, the full turn of the mainsail, so it peels off halfway and you haven't got it out of the flow. Um, you want the level of flow is that's when the that's when the wind is sort of attached to the sail and when you if you had woolies all the way around your sail, which I used to test with sails is you put you put woolies all the way around the sail and see how far you can get the level of flow to run at the back. If the um, 
if the sail is too full in light airs, the, next, the wind will peel off it a third or halfway down and half the sail is wasted. So you're trying to flap the sail in light airs to get the wind to stay with it because it's too lazy to go away around. When it's 10 knots, the wind will go around whatever shape you give it because um, there's enough strength in it to do that and deeper is faster, with a reason. A uh, little bit, you know, you let off that much on, on the power tool, you will go a little bit more power because of the sea. Once you get over 10 knots, it's just going to drag you because the back will get too deep. And once you get over 10 knots, you start to pull it flash and flash. And uh, the only problem with these ways to pull it too flat, you pull the legs off the vein when it's blowing. It just rips the front off the vein. Um, so you've got to be careful, particularly when you've got the, the ice hole very tight, and then you put the kicker on, it just rips the clips off the front. That's not going to happen. So yeah, again, it's, it is your, just like the jig foot thing, it's your, it's your power control, and if you're not going well, it's probably wrong. But when you think you're going well, you know, the guy that's never sailed isn't going to get to the front of the fleet with the best settings. You have to judge, am I doing as well as I usually can? That's the level you're trying to achieve, and is it slightly better than usual? Oh, I must remember that. That worked. And what about the um, uh, the jib block? You know, you've got the choice of the three holes. Yeah, <laughs> I use the top hole up to up to eight knots okay. um, because that gives me a bit more shape. If you use the top hole, it gives me more fullness. I use that up to eight. When I know the wind's going to be light all day, I use the top hole. Okay. Um, but if in doubt, it doesn't make a huge difference. But it, it just tightens the leech a little bit, gives you a little bit more shape for the same position. It's like moving the travel forward on both steps. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit more shape. Um, particularly if it's choppy, you definitely want it. Because it gives you a bit more power in a chop. Less height, more power. Okay. I haven't prepared anything, and otherwise I have a list of what to say. But you're asking good <laughs> questions, so I can't prepare It's great. Yeah, okay. Any more questions about, should we go and do some sweaty stuff outside? Could you talk about maybe the format, for when we're on the water, when we are racing, how do you, uh, how will it work the most efficiently for you? So we'll have, say we, we have about, looks like we'll have about six boats worth of people. We can race, we can do windward lures, we can do uh, the whole race, or we can do uh, several starts, or we can do how do you want us to uh, approach the racing part of this? Um, oh, I've thought about that. We, yeah, we haven't discussed that. We have uh, two boats from the marina. One can be a, a chase, a boat that can just follow the, the group of boats around or, or move around amongst the boats. We have a, a hailer, so, so a megaphone, um, if you want it, to be able to talk to people. Yeah, we do, not, we do not have a rib, so you, it's not going to be really easy to physically go from the power boat to a sailboat, but you can go near enough to tell somebody what, what it is you want to explain. We don't have a rib. We don't have a rib that's fast enough to stay with the boats. Um, you can attempt to get on the boat if you want, but I, I recommend that maybe you don't consider that, but just consider a... I'm very good at swimming. Okay. <laughs> I, I, fell out of, I fell out of his boat in, in, in the Muscat the water's during a, a race. The water's a lot warmer here. So yeah. Yeah. But, and they, they were giggling so much they couldn't help me get back in. <laughs> Crew in. No, 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 forget it. And uh, well, I, I, we're talking about the format, and I want to talk about kite hoisting and kite twists and a couple of things before we actually go out. But is there anything about rig and setup? Actually, the most important thing is you said is tidal the water. In terms of the format, um, well, I thought I thought we'd just do uh, finish off. What we and then, um, then perhaps the answer is to go down, look at the boat set up. Then we can have a bite to eat, perhaps get some water in us, and then go float. Yeah. Um, so there's, I've got That's coffee tea, Colin. Coffee tea. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, thank you. So Just for the word, Wayne. Thank, uh, yeah. And, and I, I guess someone else might want to order one if you to. <laughs> I think since it's the other one. The morning, so I'll, I'll have a coffee. Uh, thanks very much. I got um, the other one for you, Jordan. Uh, just. Uh, you you need that. Need that.
takes up JB Cuts down. Uh, the three important things. Uh, the first thing is the, the biggest skill of kite work is, is teamwork. And the most important thing is not to ask the crew to do things that they are capable of doing, because then they'll mess it up. <laughs> so, the one I love is, you know, when you're coming down to the bottom mark, there you are, okay, so I'm just around the, around the bottom mark, and you see this guy who's coming in on port with a case up. He's going to jag it there, round it there, round it there, and he hasn't told the crew yet. And uh, they're going, is he going to get the kite down yet? And, and this is the guy who's doing really well. He's up in the front part of the fleet. And you're going, oh, Joe's up the front. Well done, him. And you're going, no, I'm going to get around that mark. <laughs> and when he's got around the mark, you can hear him all out the beat explaining to the crew what they've been wrong. Okay? He's really getting into them. All right? Now, that's the first basic thing about crew management, is you should know your crew. And don't ask them to do more than they can do. I remember my, uh, my nephew, uh, Ed, Edwin, who sells us quite a lot. And uh, we did quite a lot of practice when he first came on the boat. And we'd go out and we'd drop the kite. And when we got ashore, he said, uh, Uncle Colin, he said, it. he said, every time we get to the bar, you leave it a little later. Why? I said, because you got it down. <laughs> oh, I get it. Okay. So I was a little. <coughs> I knew how quick he could get it done. Bloody hell, he's quick. I mean, he's tremendously quick. But I, 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 you get the feeling. And uh, sometimes you've got a boat you know, inside you, you've got to leave it late, otherwise you'll get the overlap, and you don't care that it's just like messing them up, at least you've got around the inside. And other times, you've got, your most important thing is to really go tight riding, because there's a boat in front of you and you're sagging the dirt, and, then you, and you want to go that side. So there's a tactical decision about the cut down that's very important. Um, now, so the first thing is crew management. And as I said, the best thing that really gets them to work well is that I've got a good shout. I've got a good shout. You know, really make it clear that you're feeling excited about it, that really helps. And uh, in fact, when I do this talk in other places, I usually finish up doing more shouting at people. Well, I don't know who might be listening and might embarrass you, but uh, I find it actually gets people attention. Uh, that's the first thing. But actually, in many ways, that whole team thing is more important than anything else I'm going to say. Because if you haven't got the team thing right, you everything else goes down the tube. Because the crew sort of really love being shouted at some days, but most days don't. Uh, and that sort of goes down the hill. Now, uh, it's been it really incredible to me over the years that really nice, mild people on the bar go on the horse boat. Somehow it all pulls out. Um, so get that one sorted out. The next thing is, is you're going to have a plan for the work part. Every member is going to know what they're doing. And I had a lot of change of crew. I've got a big family. In Cow's Week, we, it's a three man boat, we sell the crew of 14. Uh, and every morning I get down to the dock, I'm out to go, but who's coming today? <laughs> now they're all good sailors. But uh, all my family can say this, but you know, you got a plan. And some days it's four because they've got three live girls, and some days you've got my brothers, or whatever else. So coming into Women Bar, we're gonna say, right, Joe, your job, you're gonna open the bag, you're gonna check the value of this gear, uh, and you're gonna make that enough, it's cut down it, and I'm gonna do the whatever it is, you've got a plan. There's no one magic way to do it. We've changed the way we do it several times in, in eight years for different reasons. And, uh, but you, the most important is to plan the way you do it. And you've been out and practiced it before the start. You <coughs> always put the before the start, you always drive and always take it down. Because that gets everybody to remember their job. Because under pressure of the bar, there's two boats behind you. You know, it, it all goes to pear shapes and they all roll past you. It's so annoying. So the fundamentals of, of, of boat handling is organization and plan. The shouting come. Second thing is, um, if you go around the Lewin Mark 
and tip the kite in the bottom of the boat and then stuff it in afterwards going up the meat. The chances of it coming out in good order are greatly reduced. As you, um, what we do if we get the bubble bar, particularly in light air, is we pull the jib on to windwards, pull the windward jib sheet on in order to clear the deck because one of the biggest problems is you start pulling the guy out it goes round the chair and into the sea and fills, which is slow. And it doesn't matter how, where you are in the fleet, everybody at the top end occasionally will do that. So, in heavy airs, you can't pull the wind. Uh, can't put it onto the woods until you pull away. But we try always to get the, the metal bit of the jib to the middle of the boat. So the deck is clear. So when you start pulling the, the guy, it's going to go off the bow, not over the side. Secondly, you've got to make sure there's a level, because that's another thing that tips it off. Because uh, the going in the water is slow and can be expensive. Um, the second thing we do um, is you, you obviously have got to clear the halyard, make sure it's not around the back of the missile, because that's slow, it gets trapped in there. Uh, so there's a whole lot of little routines. And it's not so much the routines that you've got routine. We actually have a printed list with our routines on. We take it to cows every morning and the car away to cows. Everyone's reading their list because they've got to remember what job they're doing today. Because we often have the same crew and they're changing from different parts of the boat. Um, so everyone knows their job. You're going to clear the alley, you're going to pull the gym to and you're, you've got everything ready. Um, now, you get a twist. We all get twists. Um, there are two ways to get a twist out. Um, one is to jerk it which works very well on new kites, but the old kites get sort of sticky and they're quite hard to clear. Um, and uh, so you get a good old jerk on it as hard as you can, let it out, bang, you're trying to get it onto your seat. That doesn't work. Jive. The next thing to do is to jive, but don't jive the kite. It's much quicker than getting it down, is to jive, but not jive the kite. And we'll try it today when you get a twist. Jive the boat. So now you've got a mess of a kite up here and the mainsail over there. You can then get hold of the guy, uh, the tack of the kite, pull it aft, which you can't do when it's underneath the mainsail. The problem with the mainsail out is the distance between the end of the pole and the mainsail is much less than the length of the foot of the, of the kite. So you can't pull the kite tight. If you jive, you can pull the kite tight along the bottom, which pulls the twist out. All right? So just jive and pull the kite off and give it a good shake. And the moment it's gone, you've got a choice there. Now you can either jive the mainsail back, which means where you want to go, or you can jive the kite through and complete the jive. Normally, as soon as it fills, we'll, we'll complete the jive. So twist out is jerking or jive, particularly with older kites, particularly with wet kites. If the kite's got wet, they really are much more likely to stick. So that's that's uh, jiving the coat sticking. Um, Sorry, can you just talk about um, batten tension as well, the top batten? So again, one of the some of the issues we get is around the. Are we going back that one again? Sorry, oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Close that chapter. <laughs> no, no, of course, of course, of course. No, I'm not joking. Okay. Um, batten tension. Yes. Um, if the, the tight of the batten are full of the sail, and since these sails are very full, I will never tighten it. I just make it so that it has no creases. I've never tightened it more than that. Because if you do, and because you can't adjust it on the boat, if the moment the wind drops, you've, got, you, you've really got this shape problem. Okay. Uh, so I just, if it's got wrinkles along the back, a little tighter. Because okay. um, I mean, sometimes on the jive, we have the issue with the back yeah. not flicking. Um, that was too tight. Probably too tight. Um, and you do. Uh, uh, but I mean, in light airs, you will have an issue, and you have to give it, a give it a good. But if you do a good, well jive, it should flip. It should flip. But you know, in light airs, it doesn't. There's nothing you can do about that, you're just going to flick it. We had to change the rules of the class because actually, it was pumping. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but now you're allowed to do that because there's no other way. And uh, a little bit of roll on the boat. And if the kicker's too loose, you can pump it more light. If it hasn't flipped, you need to put the kicker on, boom, and then let the kicker off again. Because that kicker on will help it uninverted. 
So that's the up and the twist. When you were in Dubai, you passed the sheet to Jonathan to help stop you twisting. When you were hoisting the kite, yeah. you passed pass the sheet to Jonathan at that to help stop you twisting. Yes, yes, uh, yeah. That's a good thing. The, uh, when, when the kite's going up, I, as the helmsman, take the sheet of the kite. And um, particularly in lighter airs, when the um, uh, guy has gone most of the way to the pole, you give it a, a tuck because you just try to stretch the foot a little bit. Um, you do it too soon because you're in a breeze, it just means you can't get it out of the pole. Um, but as soon as it's nearly out of the pole, you're already sort of keeping it a bit of a tuck and make sure that it, the one thing you don't want is that the sails all disappear up the bow. You've got to keep the guy, the, the sheet end, right up by the boom. Um, and then as soon as it fills, you're letting some out because it always, it's always too tight when it first fills. But yeah, a lot of crews, you get around the fills and you go, get on in out, guys, or we're going to, you know, because the boat won't get going, but it's really up there, not pulled in too tight. So, yeah, I use, I, I do the sheet now. I used to pull the kite up, but uh, I, I've changed, I do the sheet, just so I can watch what's happening and give it a bit of time, reduces the risk of the twist. And when you're actually going around and doing the hoist, are you bearing off dead down wind, or are you sort of more... Reach. The stronger the wind, the more you wear off. Okay. Because you, you don't want the boat leaning. Yeah. In order to get the kite up reaching in a blow, which is what the really top guys do, you've got to have someone on that kite to get it up quicker than you can think about going in the sea. Uh, you need a young lad who's really going to go for it. Because the moment there's a mistake, it's in the sea and it's under the boat. So we, we go down. We bear off. Uh, but you know, you go for bonds, you can't do that. Because you bear off during the second line. And you get out of it, feels beautifully, and they're all going jum, jum, jum past you. So you've got no choice. You have to stay up. But uh, in most events, I'm out of Because there's less risk. Easy kick, I'm out of Everybody ready, place. And just coming back, I mean, because we have a number of issues of poles out early. <laughs> the perennial. Poles out early. <laughs> Yeah. Well, when, when we were in Dubai, they introduced the rule that because uh, we had a spreader bar always at the top of the window, so we were never allowed to put pole up until we'd gone round the window. Okay. And, and if you if you put it out on the leg to the spreader bar, you then had to be that had to be a continuous action then to put the spinning bar. Well, well, the rule yeah. is continuous action, but. but uh, I don't know what, what what's the class. The normal rule is that if you the way the way most people say it is if you put the pole up in someone, you're out. But if you put the pole out a bit early, there we go. Get a life, who cares, you know. And uh, <laughs> the, the, the giving the guy that I agree because he's got a pole out early. Okay, he's got out halfway up the beat, well yeah. But you know, uh, we're trying to have fun out there and he's not gonna get that much of a profit out of it. Um, particularly if you've got a particularly good crew, it's going to cause them pain. Most people don't worry about it. Uh, yeah, because there are a few people in the UK for you to if you get your pub out of it early. And you just give them that look, you know, <laughs> get a knife. <laughs> and uh, you never see anyone protest about it. It gets a lid. But, um, yeah, if I've got three girls on the boat, it's cows week, and they're giving me a lid, you know, I get a get knife. But um, the, the rule is it's supposed to be a continuous action. Yeah. Um, but what is a continuous action? You are, you've put the pole up, you're opening the bag, you're checking the hand, you know. <laughs> God, I can't take it. <laughs> you go to a protest meeting and say, well, what, is it, what does continuous action mean? I pull the pole up, then I open the bag, then I let the cutting them off, then I let the bag torn off. It's all a continuous action. But they have no chance, have they? The person must sit there and go, well, I don't know why. Right, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm joking. Uh, just go through the joint. Joke. Yeah, uh, we've done through. the up. Any more questions on the up? We'd love to make this last for someone with it very well. Sometimes um, uh, it doesn't treat, it doesn't, you know, I, I launch it up, it goes up, and then it doesn't um, secure, it comes down a bit. Never had it, and I. Charge the crew. Shout at the crew. I am the crew. Well, shout at the other crew. So, yeah, yeah. So, I'm 
So it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't, the key to seem to work, especially in the strong winds. Yeah, I've suggested this, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, what is, what is, um, what maintenance? Uh, and a lot of you, uh, <laughs> some of the older boats have plastic cleats on the main helium. They actually the, the, the cleat is plastic inside, the outcut metal ones. Uh, they're much better, they grip better. A uh, bit of maintenance because it has to actually go in and then go down. Because what happens is it goes in and it fills and when the pressure comes on it slides because it hasn't actually you know how it does that clicking noise when it goes down? It hasn't actually got quite in the jam. So you've got to get to the jammer and get, make sure it's clicked down into position. Mm. And then if it still goes, it means that the teeth are not sharp enough anymore and you've got to put your teeth on, mm. uh, on the cleat. Um, I mean, I know that the, the, uh, you don't get that much wind here, but it's probably maintenance and not clicking properly. Mm. You've pulled it up, but you haven't given it that. Yeah. Done with it. What's your fault? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But the basic principle is something happens wrong with the front of the boat, it's the helm of the boat. And with all that going up the beat, you know, the crew told me the wrong side, that's why we did that. Uh, any more questions about the up there? Okay, then we're on to the jive. Um, the heavy air jives at the front, but we don't, we, we, we don't have a lot of that here, uh, but we'll mention a little bit about heavy air jives. But in, in the very light airs, if you are, it takes a lot of practice to do a roll jive without making a complete mess of it, and it's worse than doing a steady jive. And I don't try and do roll jive unless I've got my regular, regular crew, because everyone's all over the place, and so you just mess it up and go twist. So it's asking quite a lot. You've got to be pretty expert to do a roll jive that isn't anything other than a wind muddle. I know they are they're quite much more difficult than these boats, they, they are the old fashioned kinds. Um, maybe that's just I've got less agile over the years, but I do find them difficult. Um, but roll jive the right way, and we do a roll in, but not a roll out pattern on the whole. So roll. One of the problems with these boats is if you jive too quickly, the kite doesn't go around; it hooks on the windward spreads, which is really, really slow. Um, so we'll talk about light air jives first. All right. So we're going along that way. The wind's behind me and we're going to jive and we're going to go that way, all right? So the crew's in the boat, the kite's fitting. Um, my number one focus is to make sure it doesn't hook on the stroud and come out the wrong side. I don't even care if I get a twist, at least I can sort that out quickly, if I do That's the number one focus. So to make sure it doesn't happen, we lean the boat in, yes. so we've got to the woods. We lean the boat to the woods, because that will give me a little bit of oomph into the jive. And as I get up into the jive, that's pushing wind through the slot onto the sail as we go into the jive. And we use that to let the sail out. We're not using that for speed. As the boat rolls, we're going to let some kite out because that gets the, the sheet forward and away from the spreader. And the moment we start to jive, one crew is feeding the guy out, the old sheet that's going to become you know, the guy's side. So at the moment you're trying to feeling it up because you just got to get it to go forward. It doesn't go forward, it's going to hook around your top soft spreader. So the most important thing in a light edge jive is to get the kite through. Up oh, now, if you're lots of experts and you get up the outside and do the roll out again, that's great, but that's asking a lot when the kite doesn't even fill the much like rugby. Um, so the main thing is to, is to make sure you don't get hooked on the wrong side. Coming out the other side, yeah, you're going to go a little bit high for a bit and get some speed on, as soon as you can, get back down low. And uh, the way we sail, which is quite unusual in light airs, is we never pull the, the tack line down. We will leave that much. Because if you... If the, uh, the tack is there, if that's your filling on the bow, look the boat. Last. If you let that up, this distance is increased. So by letting that up, my kite is going out that way. And then the wind speed at this level is much lower than the wind speed higher up. So my theory is if you let the kite up a little bit, you're catching more of the stronger breeze 
10, 20 feet off the ground. Uh, so that means uh, that we go generally lower than other people downwind because we're picking up higher air that's got more speed on it because the air also that's not much good. And also that means we can go slightly deeper because as you let it up, you can let sheet out a bit more and it comes around a bit more. So we play with this quite a bit, other boats don't. But we're definitely, at any championship we go to, we go lower than other people. Not necessarily faster, but we try and go lower. And it's great when you run someone behind someone that they're going onto the run, and they can maybe go away from you, but they can't jump out. Because you've got, you've got you, you, you can go just that two, three degrees lower, and they're going, can we get a jump? And come, no, I'm not here. I'm not here, because he blocked them. And they try and they try and go lower, and then the cut cut collapses. So a little bit of fiddling with that, you can go to depth. Now for the for the jive, that's that in heavy edge jive, uh, we often use two people on the kite. One one race jive, the bowman takes the, the kite that's going to be let out, and the regular crew's got the other one ready to really get the action going for the jive. Because if you don't pull it through and it, it goes around the wrong side of the horse plane, you're in a right way, yes. So you actually have someone feeding. Well, the, the, it's not that in heavy years there's no feed need. Yeah. You're, what you try and do is the letting out person's job is to let it only to the full stay and no further yeah. because it's still filling. And so the guy that's pulling in doesn't have to pull in any more than from the full stay to the back. So he's going out to the full stay, he's got it, let go. But you don't let that one go and it, because he's then got two more meters to pull in, which means it's going to invert and go around the full stay. Because you're trying to control it as much as possible within that full stay region. You don't want the, the sheet to go further out than the full stay, because then you've got more to pull back in. And the helmsman's got to steer the giant. Not just, giant, okay, Shh. what the fuck's the crew doing? And you don't hear them being a giant, you know? <laughs> you've got to actually go, right, are they ready? Yeah, I'm on the way, yeah. Now we're playing great. So go for it, guys. Yeah, well, you make that time, so we'll wait for the next wave. I don't jive until, you know, hell does it matter where I'm, unless it's the lower mark. It doesn't matter if I need get another 20 lengths. Um, unless I'm overstanding. Wait until, you know, wait until it's the right, oh, the wind's down a bit. Good, there's a gust going through, now we'll jive, you know. So there's all that planning to Because it is a difficult maneuver, you've got to make it easier for yourself and the crew. I always, when there's any air, pull the main sheet in, pull the travel right up to windwards. Because you want that main sort of <coughs> the shrouds. If you try and jive in heavy airs with the mainsail shrouds, you've got to go almost 90 degrees the other side reaching to pull the main cut across. If you're 90 degrees reaching and you've dropped to five knots on the jive, the cut fills, what happens? Down she goes. So, in order to jive, you pull the mainsail off the spreaders before you even start the process. You get the mainsail up, well off the spreaders, and you do that by pulling the traveler right to windwards, because then when you've jived, it's all the way out already. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to try and let it off on the cleat and hope it doesn't jam on something and pull it down. So make the job easier, choose your moment carefully, and, and, and jive with the crew because they are your weakness. They are idiots. And if you don't follow them, it will actually be your fault because you've got to do it at the right speed for them. But it's heavy. Because your job's easy. It's, you know, it's the easy job, isn't it? You just gotta push that thing across. They've got a hard work to do, so you've got to follow them. Please don't get us back at you. <laughs> 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 uh, no, this is this is my normal talk, so that's fine. Uh, I was a qualified coach, but uh, I am uh, not a qualified coach anymore, so I'm probably not sure to do this stuff. Uh, I, uh, well, I had to go back. I had to go and do a week's course to become an RIA keelboat coach. Uh, and I gave up a week of my life to this course. And at the end, I failed it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I had to have an assessment from this youngster, about 28, from the RIA. And I went out to the water and did an assessment and came back in. The head coach of the child camps and clients said, He's failed you. <laughs> and I said, You what? <laughs> I said, He's failed you. I said, Jesus, I've done a whole week and I failed. I said, yes. He said, well, I said, you didn't understand waving to the fishes. And I said, I still don't understand waving to the fishes. What's that got to do with a can of beer? 
He said, well, he asked you to explain waving for fishes, and he didn't know how to do it. And uh, so I said, OK, well, promise him I will learn what waving for fishes will mean, see if you can do a deal. So the deal was struck, and I had to be taken out the next week and, and go over the assessment again, and I'd be allowed to qualify as a coach. Because if you're not qualified as a coach, you're not insured, so you can't teach. And I wasn't even charging for my time. I was given another week of my time to teach the cadets in the hours. And I've been told I couldn't do the second week because I ended up, I mean, this is about fishes. Uh, anyway, that was an aside. Um, where were we? So what is Lewis Bar. What is the fishes? I haven't So obviously, you're tacking and where you put your hand. And, you know, the kids have to wait for the fishes because that means, I don't know, something to do with the way you change to us. When they asked me to go and do another three day refresher in order to really renew my license, I oh, right, right, right. um, the um, So I can no longer teach children to sail unless there's somebody present who's got a CRP check and is officially qualified, otherwise, if I'm not qualified to do it. Um, the, um, well, that's all right, well, yes. The part for wings and fishes. Uh, next one is Lewin Mark. And then we're done, I think. Sorry? Don't drop me in lightnings. That was Charlie and I did. We just did that one. Yeah. By the way, what is it? You're away with it. See, this is the cruise fault. Yeah, let's get going then. Yeah, absolutely. Switch up your stainless. I'm going to do that. I need to know. Lewin Mark, tell the crew reasonably well in advance what your plan is, and especially tell them if you change it. Um, so they've got some idea of what they're supposed to do. Remind them which way round them up by going. If there's a gate, it's quite, can, the crew do like to know which gate you're going round if there's a gate. They don't want to just ride at it. Um, and so we start 20 legs out, but we're coming back on, a bit of backstay, get the main tram on the right. You really don't want to run the road mark, the main tram is all the way down the bottom, and the crew's up the bow. There's no way to pull it in. So we're around this mark to port, right, main shaft are up, all the way to the top. So everything's ready, 20 legs out. Cummings back on, outhaul's back on. So you're all ready, main halyard's coiled. Now we throw, we throw the main, we throw the kite halyard over the side. Put the kite down. I don't know what you guys do. Uh, because then no one can stand on it. So ready to kite down. Uh, we're now 10 legs out. You can't have it at the side, you can't lift this boat behind because in theory if they hit it, it's your fault, but thank you, no one's ever bothered anybody, lots of people turn them aside now. So you, you get the coil, you hold the end of the kite halyard, throw it over the side so you can see the coil of the water, there's no twist, gone. Then there is no possibility of a kite twist or a knot. It is impossible because it's way out there. You do tend to want to throw it over the, the side the kite's not coming down, otherwise it's a right mess. So if you take the kite down the port side, you throw the handle over the starboard side. And then it's out of your way, and then when the person pushes it up the clean, there's no possibility to jam. Yeah, you can still accidentally re-jam it, but that gets the kite out of the way, and uh, that's, that's problem solved. Getting the kite down, well, it's, there's lots of different ways. In light airs, it's really not very difficult. Generally, try and get it down to windwards as you come into the bar because then there's no risk of it going into the gym, into the gym sheet. So if we're rounding the mark, if we're rounding, you've got a plan for the windward mark. So if, if it's a port end course, the first port end course, you definitely, the windward mark, got to have the pole, the kite set up for a better way set. But after that, it doesn't really matter, unless there's some tactical reason, which side is on. But the lured mark, if we're going around that way, you want to get the kite down of choice on this side of the boat. Because that way, as you run the mark, the kite's coming out of windows. And therefore, it's not going to go into the jib cleat. The crew isn't trying to, it isn't less likely to go in the water, all of that. So, uh, unless there's a reason not to, try and get it down the windows. Now, if you know the windward mark is going to be, you're in the middle of the fleet, there's going to be lots of boats, you're going to have to get it down the windows. But there's no particular reason because it's easier to get in other rooms. And so therefore, very often, you know, if we're coming in on start, we'll get down before the mark, we'll go down the woods, and then drive around the mark. 
And that's the who lets off what, there's a dozen different ways to do it. Just somebody, there's only two jobs, one is letting off, one is getting it in the bag. And um, if the crew is organised, they can help helm with the main, which is much quicker. If you leave, if you left it just a little bit earlier to get it down, so one of the crew can put in main before you, you can get, you go much nearer the mark, and you're much less likely to be in the dirt than the guy in front. But better than that, there's no risk of the guys behind you stopping you being able to tack. So a good run is terribly important, tactically. So leaving it an extra length late can lose you three lengths to the low bar. If you drop it on the windward side, uh, it doesn't get stuck. The, uh, uh, the force there? Yeah. Uh, well, so do we do something just to make sure? That, that, that probably means you've, you've not got a good tie on. Uh, we, we, we don't tie the, we have a string from the, uh, right, so a string, between. A string between the kite and the thing, so that there's, not, there's, it, there's less, it, it does catch a little bit, but show me how your connection is, and I'll have a look at that. Uh, but yeah, jamming on the full stay, and that's just, once it's jammed, you just need power. Two crew pulling it will get it off the full stay. Uh, the moment, you know, the other crew should be watching, if they see that happen, they've just got to get up on the kit because there's no other way to do it in power. But if you, and from Hell's point of view, and if that's happening, better way of it to pressure off the car pull. What about um, pole retrieval, <coughs> putting the pole in? How are you set up for that? Um, well, we uniquely have a pole retrieval rope, um, and, um, which is a separate rope that lies in the bottom of the boat that is connected to the pole. So, uh, um, if I'm coming into the Lewis Mark and I know there's a pole risk in other words, we could hit someone with it, uh, any of the crew can pull the pole in. Okay. Uh, we go to use it once on the gatter, but it can save you from breaking the bloody thing. Yeah. And you've just got that moment where you want to get the inside, the pole's still out. If someone gets pulled in, you can get the inside. Um, so we have a pole retrieval rope, which is permitted by the rules. Um, but in general terms, the crew have clearly got to get the pole in as soon as possible. But if the, if the down is a little late or it's going a bit wrong, um, and this guy is up to his eyeballs in, in this, he's not going to get pulled in. So the other crew can just pull the pole through. Sometimes the pole comes in at its own. Isn't that lovely? It's just an instrument. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, this happens when you undo the boat. <laughs> no, you, you, you do that by undoing the tack and. The pole. Yeah, you do the, yeah. If you undo, if you drop the kite up uh, from from up, and then like you're on, you're actually bagging it. So before you start bagging it, you undo the both the tack line and the pole out rope, and then you start bagging it. If they are normally going through the cleats, so they are not locked, actually the pole would be dragged by the tack line that you're feeding in, and then it would go in. But it depends on the lubrication. <laughs> Uh, maintenance again. Again. <laughs> maintenance. Yeah. If, if, the pole, if when you've got if you put the pole out on the dock, fine. Put your pole out on the dock. Um, all the way out, with no air, and then go up the front and give it a tap. If it doesn't go in on the tap, it's too tight. Yeah. And if your pole is jammed out, 